the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I got the invitation I was coming to First Baptist Indian Trail, I pulled out my lexicon to make sure that I represented our church and the Lord the right way, so I wanted to get, you know, some big and heavy words to express my gratitude, so here goes, let me try. I'm hippopotamusly happy and elephantly glad to be here <laughs> on tonight. Worship has been rich and rewarding. What a warm and winsome expression of God's grace that we have already encountered. I'm glad to be here. I want to invite you to take your Bibles. Now, I actually have a physical Bible, but I didn't bring it with me. That may not be a good way to start, but I do have a Bible. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? In Jeremiah chapter 18, commencing at verse 1 and concluding at verse 8, this text is so tailored to teach us tonight that when you put your life in God's hands, your failures are never final. Hear what God says to his people from his word. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So he went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me and he said, can I not do with First Baptist Indian trails as this potter does? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Several years ago, Sharita and I were in London and we took a cab to take us on Regent Street between Oxford and Piccadilly Circus. I was told that the most famous potter that ever lived had a store dedicated in his name, Josiah Blake Wedgwood. And so I took a trip to his house to see his work. He was an 18th century potter and a apprentice to a father that was a potter. And in the great yellow fever epidemic, he lost one of his legs and learned how to turn the wheel with the other leg. And somewhere, not since then or now, his ability to touch and tone the texture of the pliable clay has never been matched. It was a delightful experience to go and see what Wedgwood had accomplished and for a store to be named in honor of him. It was a trip I took a young preacher to the potter's house. But then I thought in a higher, holier sense, another trip of a, another prophet that had gone to a house to 
go to see the work of a potter at the wheel working with clay. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, go to the potter's house and I want to show you my word. There's something inherent in pottery that seems to be matted to the ministry of God and how he works at the life of the will. There's something unchanging. Regardless of where you go, potters work the same way. I was in Mexico once and I went and I saw a potter working his craft and he worked it the same way that I saw a 17th generation potter work adjacent to the grave of Abraham and Sarah at Hebron. There were different locations and geography, but no different than the way the potter worked in Johannesburg, South Africa, working at the wheel. Technology changes, instruments that we use in technology change, but the way potters work at the wheel work the same way. I don't know if that's why God told Jeremiah to go to the potter's house or not. But it seems that he sent him to a place where Jeremiah could experience that God works the same way yesterday, today, and forevermore. Here tonight, if you would, for the next little while, <laughs> go with me to the potter's house. Because there seems to be some life lessons that you and I can learn tonight and that we can apply to our heart and experience the great grace that only God can give to us. In the potter's house, we do learn that lesson, that all of us have encountered some failures, and some because of failure have gotten out of the race, but failure tonight, according to this text, is not final. Inside the potter's hut, you see the potter, by the way, for those of you who are students of scripture, this is an allegory. Not all texts like this are to be interpreted this way, but this is an allegory that the potter stands in for God and the wheel for life circumstances and the clay for humanity. In it, we learn lessons about the potter, that the potter, the divine potter, is like the human potter in only one way. And that is the divine potter and the human potter have the same privileges to touch the texture and tone it at will, whenever, wherever, and however they want to touch it. That's the similarity of the divine potter and the human potter. One of the great battlegrounds that humanity wrestles with is over the battlefield of the mind. Chuck Colson said that the greatest battlefield of the mind is whether or not we believe in the creation or not. If we can get that right, we can get everything else right. But if we believe that we are some kind of fortuitous accident of biochemistry, then we're going to have a rough go at it. But if we believe that there is a God, and I believe there is, then we believe that God has the divine right as creator to touch us wherever, whenever, and however he wants to touch us. But the divine potter is different from the human potter in some other ways. For the human potter, is filled with flaws. Regardless of how skilled Blake Wedgwood might be and other potters, there's always a flaw in their technique, in their texture, the way they touch and tone. They're not perfectionists, but not so with God. God is the perfect potter, that when he touches us, he always gets the best out of us. There's another way in which 
the divine potter is not like the human potter. And that is the human potter can only work at one vessel at a time. I've seen them working that craft and they'll stand there and that, at that wheel rather, they'll sit there and they'll work that clay. And they keep their focus on what they're working on. And if they're distracted from it, just the slightest distraction can cause a serious flaw and mar the vessel in the hand of the potter. But not so with God. God can work with us tonight and First Baptist Indian Trail while he's working with the people at the Church Without Walls in Houston, Texas, where the human potter can only work with one vessel. God the potter can work with billions of vessels and not mar any one of them at any one time. But then there's a final differentiation. And that is the divine potter is not like the human potter in the sense that the human potter never created the clay. It has to rely upon a creator. But God who has created the clay knows how best to work with the clay. Hopefully tonight, if I don't say anything else, you will leave home, leave here to go home with a sense of encouragement over maybe some wife or husband or son or daughter or grandchild that seems to have gotten out of the way to know that since God created them, God knows how to reach them, grab them, and bring them back to himself. <laughs> Hallelujah tonight for the Lamb. If we left tonight out of the hut of the potter, you and I have really said enough to be encouraged. But change the angle of vision. And you see that Jeremiah didn't stop just with the potter, but he looked at the wheel and on it was the clay. And the clay was symbolic of humanity. And so as he looked at the clay, he said, we too, like the potter, are like that clay in one way, and that is we have been created for one single purpose, and that is to yield our lives unto God in the same way that a lock yields to a key, a bow yields to a violin yields to a bow. We too are created to yield to God. And it's only when we yield to him do we really experience what peace and real life and real joy really looks like. Some years ago, I was in what people in Western Europe say is the most famous address in that country, number 19 Vergasa Street in Vienna. Some of you know what that room represents. It is the waiting room of the famed atheist psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. The same brogade furniture sits out there. And I stood there and I thought that he was a man who made such a contribution to medicine. And one thing that he would say to his patients though, if you want peace, you need to get rid of your neurosis. And he said the biggest neurosis you need to get rid of is the, reno, reno, uh, the neurosis that there is a God up there, out there, somewhere. He said, get rid of that and you'll have peace. And then I thought about how he lived his life. A man with absolutely no peace. Then before I left, I said, you know, Sigmund Freud's room is still kept the way it was when people would enter in that, but he's gone. But the very one that he said to get rid of is still here. Some of y'all will get that in a minute. He says, get rid of God, get rid of this image of Jesus. And I looked at it and I said, Freud been gone. But Jesus is still here, and when you're gone and when I'm gone, he'll still be here 
In fact, heaven and earth will pass away, but the Lord Jesus will stand forever. If that's all I had to say, that too would be enough for us to leave here saying, I understand the role of the potter in the clay. But step to the other side and look at another angle of vision. And there is the potter, there's the clay on the wheel, but there is the wheel itself. And the wheel turns round and round and round. Sometimes up and sometimes down and sometimes level to the ground. Circumstances have a way of getting at the best of us. Circumstances, sometimes people get so frustrated with them, they say that these circumstances have broken me. They, they break me. But tonight, the very things that can break you are the things that God can use to make you. God can take those very circumstances in your life to make the difference, especially when we understand what we've been made out of. One day, a rose bush had a conversation with a footpad. And in the conversation, the footpad said to the rose bush, I'm always amazed when people step on you, you get sweeter. But when they step on me, I get harder. What's the difference? And the rose bush says, the difference is simple. The sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. He said, it's what you're made out of. It's what's inside of you. It's how you respond to the circumstances around you. Some people in bad circumstances they get bitter. There are some other people in bad circumstances, they really get better. There are some people that quit and there are others that join in. And that's what circumstances of life does. It's kind of like the dramatic monologue that uh, Robert Browning conducts with Rabbi Ben Ezra when he talks about the wheel of the plastic dance. And that is these circumstances turn round and round and round and you don't know where they're going to lead you, but you have left up to you how you are going to respond to the circumstances that have happened to you. I don't know what's going to happen to us. but We do have a right and a responsibility of how we respond to what has happened to us. This is the image that Jeremiah had when the word of the Lord came to him and said, go into the potter's house. But you know what's strange? Are the people that actually think great people that we know have reached their heights without some serious circumstances. I mean, you can go down the list and just name whether they be athletes or academics or people who have reached heights. And almost always in all of their lives, there's some hard circumstance that helped propel them to where they are. I'm a music lover. I don't know anything about music. And y'all better be glad I don't because I probably wouldn't speak to anybody. But I love listening to music. And I have had the chance to sit in Mozart's house. I didn't know anything about how to listen to symphony or music. I had to actually take a course on how do you listen to this? And so I sat in there and the docent gave me some background on what some people say is the greatest musical genius in world history. He said Mozart had been many times exploited by Leopold, his dad. He would take advantage of his gifts to make money for the family. Mozart then would leave and he would go to Vienna and he would almost be a vagabond in some ways in the sense of not having a job for six years and moving 13 times or 11 times in 13 years. But he never stopped writing music. 
out of work, but he never stopped writing music, moving from place to place, and he never stopped writing music. He never let circumstances stop him from doing what he believed God had called him to do. And tonight, I encourage you, I even challenge you, that whatever circumstances you are going through, from one place to the next, don't stop doing what God has called you to do. I don't care how hard the church is, keep on preaching. I don't care how difficult the circumstance, keep on singing. It doesn't matter how bad life is, keep on ushering, keep on leading, keep on teaching until the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant, well done. <laughs> Circumstance. That's how God makes us. But beyond how God makes us, look at how life mars us. In the fourth verse, there's the beautiful image that when Jeremiah sees the potter at the wheel working, he notices that the pot in the hand of the potter gets marred. And he goes back and reworks the potter. Now, I want to stay there for a minute because look at the beauty of what this word is saying. Jeremiah observes, as the word is shown to him, that the potter works at a vessel. The vessel is marred in the hand of the potter. And if I got to be marred, let me be marred in God's hands. Because if God is holding me, then God can show, help me, and God can fix me, and God can keep me. So here he is working, and the potter is being, the pottery is being marred. But do you see what happens? The potter keeps going back to the very place where the pottery has been marred, which is a picture of God's patience that God keeps on going back to the very place where we need him the most. When the potter is working at the wheel and the clay is in his hand, he takes his delicate fingers and possibly feels a rock or stone or stick. He has to pull it out. The removal might mar the very vessel that he's working on. But he goes back and starts working, filling in, and reshaping possibly. But he stays at it until he gets it right. And so tonight, some of you, God has been working and working and working in your life until he gets it right. I hear what you're saying. That's my neighbor, not me. Because when you look at the story or this allegory, you pick up and you say, well, who are we going to blame? Because a lot of times we want to blame the potter. You know, we get mad at God and we blow up at him and we say, it's God's fault. As a pastor, I hear people say that to me. Uh, Paz, uh, you, you don't understand. As if I live on another planet. <laughs> Some of you, you've heard people say that to you and they come to you, they know you're a Christian, they know you go to the church and they need help, they feel like you can help them, but then they make this comment, well, you don't understand. As if you don't live in the real world. The world we live in is, is the real world. It's the real world. They blow up at God. But other times, other times, they blow up at their circumstances, don't they? Yeah. They blame the circumstances, the wheel that turns them round and round. They blame that. So I was in Hawaii. And, and we go up to the, what is the big volcano. And I was looking for a lot of spewing, you know, flames. I was looking for drama. <laughs> Kilauea. And, and all I saw were plums of smoke coming up. 
And Miss West, she was all excited about it. And I act like I was excited about it. <laughs> and at the observatory, the man at the observatory, he says, it's an active volcano. Well, I, I, I couldn't see this because it's buried down in the earth. And then you remember a couple of years ago, this active volcano starts spewing out its lava and it's tearing up homes and towns in its wake. And I said, that, that's people I know. Underneath the skin, beneath it, there are little plums of smoke that come up. But they're bawling inside, mad at God and mad at life and just waiting for the right moment to spew everything out. Waiting for it. And I said, that's people that blame circumstances. So if you can't blame the potter and you cannot blame the will, who do you blame? I like preaching to y'all. I, I, I see you ready to just say, you blame the clay. It's nothing wrong with the potter. There's nothing wrong with the wheel. Oh, Lord, but there's something wrong with the clay. The clay is broken and it's marred and it's scarred. And at best, we can say tonight that we have a God that is patiently working with us. My, my pastor used to say this when you would go and you were put in the church, and uh, he would stand and give the pastor the charge. I can hear him now in my ears. He would say, there are three things that I want to say to you tonight. And Then he would say, number one, be patient. Number two, be patient. Number three, be patient. <laughs> we chuckle at it because we know if it had not been for the patience of God with us. Many of us wouldn't be here tonight. That God has been patient with us. And he's been so patient to work with us because he knows what he's working with. One of the top leaders in all of the world, even now, when they say, who are the top leaders? In the top five, the name Moses still appears. And for the first 40 years of Moses' life, he's working, working, working to become somebody. He learns math and astrology and science and architecture, and he's working at being somebody. And then one misstep in life sends him to the backside of the desert and he spends the next 40 years learning that he's nobody. And then the last 40 years of his life, he is celebrating that he has learned that when a person thinks that they are somebody and only learns that they are nobody, can, that, that God can use anybody. Tonight, many of us are used because, like Moses, we remember when we were trying to be somebody, only to discover we were nobody, and now we're rejoicing that God can use anybody. I'm done. But let me preach the gospel now. <laughs> because there's one last thing in the story. You see how God makes us, how life mars us, but then finally how God mends us. How God puts us back together. And that's always a process that God is working and working and working on us to get us back, to make us into what he wants us to do and to be. So here it is, and I sit down. You got Jeremiah down at the potter's house. 
and he sees what's taking place, and then God says, I want to put Jeremiah 18 in the practice. Because in the 19th chapter, you discover that Jeremiah comes in with this beautiful pottery, and he walks to the edge of the cliff, and he throws it down. He has Congress and the Senate, and he got the, the Southern Baptists with him, <laughs> and the National Baptists, all following him, and he breaks this, this beautiful piece of pottery, and it shatters into pieces. That's chapter 19. In fact, when you go to the Holy Land, they'll take you to that place, and you can dig down in there and find the rubble. And only does that happen when, when the pottery just won't work right in God's hand. So God says, I've got to fix Ralph West. And, and, and a potter in a house can't do it. So I got to get me a potter that's an expert in dealing with broken materials. So when he tried everybody he could try, Abraham couldn't work and Isaac couldn't do it and Jacob couldn't do it and Joseph couldn't do it. God says, I got to get a potter that knows how to specialize in broken material. And so he reached over and he saw his own son. And he said, I'm going to send you 600 years into the future. And this is what we read. And the word became flesh because it had to become what it was going to work on. And so the word became flesh. And we dwell, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And tonight, the only reason why you are here tonight is because we have a God in Jesus Christ that went to a hill called Calvary and on that old rugged cross. I can preach for myself. They hung him up there. And he died, but thank God he didn't stay dead. But early one Sunday morning, he got up with all power, power to straighten out your life, power to pick you up, power to raise the dead, power to give sight to those that cannot see, power to unstop deaf ears that they may hear the melody of God power to put running in your feet, clapping in your hand, joy in your heart. And I'm going to sit down when I tell you, but this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. This love that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. This peace I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. I better sit down now, but my soul got happy. There's hope I have. The world did not give it, and the world can't take it away. This hope I have, this joy I have, only God can give it. Only God can give it. Only God can give it. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.